Zechariah chapter 11. We've been preaching through this prophet's, uh, this Old Testament prophet, and I, I said last week, I said it was the news today, 2,500 years ago. And uh, Zechariah takes us through the things that have happened to Israel and the things that are going to happen in Israel. Uh, last week we talked about the great ingathering. Zechariah chapter 10 speaks of when the Israelites will be gathered again into their land. And we've seen that happen starting in, again in 1948 with the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. <laughs> and even before that, some Jews were starting to migrate back to that land. Uh, of course, they are not back in belief yet. They have not accepted their Messiah as a nation. Many Jews have, but as a nation, they are still there in unbelief. When Jesus returns, he will reveal himself to them, and they will own him as their Messiah. But before those things can happen, and before what happened in 1948, we know that the history of the nation of Israel from the time of the crucifixion until then was a history of persecution and inquisition and uh, out being outcast and being uh, vilified by almost every nation on the earth. Even today, how many nations are true friends of Israel? Uh, we, I guess we are in, you know, outwardly or, you know, but deep down inside our current administration is not a friend of Israel. And it seems every other nation on the face of the earth has become an enemy of Israel, if not openly, then at least uh, covertly. But all through those thousands of years since the crucifixion, Israel has suffered. And they've suffered because uh, when they you know, crucified Jesus, the, the leaders of Israel said, his blood be on us. And indeed, the things they have suffered uh, is because... They've called, they call a curse down on themselves when they rejected their Messiah. Chapter 11 of Zechariah deals with that very fact. It deals with why God has taken his hand off of the nation of Israel. If you read Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, the Apostle Paul deals with that very same thing. He deals with the difference between spiritual Israel and national Israel and uh, why there's a, there's a difference there. But Zechariah says this, starting at verse 1. He says, Open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Now, when you read that, we would think he'd be talking to the nation of Lebanon. But in actuality, these, these prophecies are directed toward Judah and directed toward Israel, particularly the temple, because the temple, if you read about uh, Solomon's temple and then the, the, the second temple, the doors were built with cedars. There was a lot of cedar wood which came from Lebanon. And this is almost like a, uh, like a rebuke to them that they were speaking to them like they were a, a foreign nation. He says, Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. How fir tree, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. How, O ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. There's a lot of language here in that. Uh, it's kind of interesting that the term forest of the vintage really means a fortified forest. And what he's saying is, he's saying, you know, Israel, you've been fortified. You've been, you've been a, a great nation and a great city. Even under Roman dominance, you know, the temple was there and they had the priesthood and they had their religion. But we know in 70 A.D., just about 40 years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Romans came in and destroyed the temple. They... Uh, uh, burnt the temple down. They occupied Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, and about 40 or 50 years later, uh, there was another revolt called the Bar Kokhba revolt. And you can read about that in history. And that's when the Romans took the Jews and just threw them out of Jerusalem and made it illegal for a, a Jew to even exist within the, the uh, city walls of Jerusalem. And that was really the time, that I believe that, that began like what, what you would call the times of the Gentiles when the Jews were completely just pushed out of Jerusalem because of their uh, rebelling against Rome. He says in verse 3, there's a, verse of uh, a voice of howling of the shepherds, for their glory is spoiled, a voice of the roaring of young lions, for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. He's saying that in the, in the city of Jerusalem where he talks about the, the shepherds 
in the Young Lions, he's, he's talking about the ecclesiastical leaders, the, the, pre, the high priest and so forth, and he's talking about the civil leaders, the Sanhedrin, the ones who were in charge of things. They were howling because everything that they built their, their life upon, uh, the things that they prided themselves being Jews, was destroyed. And they were no longer allowed to practice their religion. They were no longer allowed to practice the thing that they prided themselves in because of their rejection of the Messiah. And we're going to see that as we read on here a little bit. <clears throat> Starting in verse 4 and on, onward, we see a picture of Israel between 70 A.D. and 1948. Uh, mistreatment of the Jews from the second century. And if you look into some of the things that had been done to them in the name of Jesus, the, the biggest persecutors of the Jews were, were the Christians, especially after Christianity became the power that, you know, the power, uh, uh, the politically correct church uh, after Constantine. They saw the Jews as Christ killers. They saw the Jews as enemies of the cross. And they were persecuted mercilessly uh, for 1,800 years uh, and still are uh, e even today. He goes on and he says in verse 4, Thus says the Lord my God, Feed the flock of the slaughter, the flock of the nation of Israel, who were slaughtered by the Romans in 70 A.D. and in 130 A.D. and have been persecuted ever since. He says to Zechariah, Show them what's going to happen. Speak to them. Whose possessors slay them, in verse 5, and hold themselves not guilty. And they that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. And their own shepherds pity them not. The, 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 the biggest persecutor of the Jew was the Christian. The ones who should have been more sympathetic to them are the ones that held them in the greatest disdain. Martin Luther, the great reformer, was an anti-Semite. Uh, and he was a, he was a rabid anti-Semite. Most of the reformers, Calvin and the rest, they hated Israel. They hated the Jews, which kind of, I, I, I don't understand that. But I don't understand today why there are people that are Christians that sit in church that, that hate Israel. I uh, might not agree with everything they do as a nation, you know, but to hate them or to have a disdain toward them, I don't quite understand that. But it's saying here that those who would be in charge of them would hate them. They would say, blessed be the Lord. Uh, they would think they were doing God a favor, just like the Apostle Paul when he was persecuting Christians. There are people that, that hate Israel, and, and they do it in the name of Jesus. He says in verse 6, For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. But lo, I will deliver the men every one unto his neighbor's hand, and into the hand of his king, and they shall smite the land, and out of their hand I will not deliver them. I, this is the curse that they called down upon themselves. When God took his hand off of them, they were his people and he was their God. This is when if you read in Hosea, the prophet, he said there was a time when God would say, lo ami, which means not my people. In this time, God has taken his hand off of Israel and even though he hasn't forsaken him, he's still going to keep his promises to the nation of Israel for all practical intents and purposes. He has rejected them as being his people for this time. And again, if you want a better insight on that, and it would take too much time to go through Romans 9, 10, and 11, but Paul deals with how God used, is using the Gentiles to drive Israel to jealousy. He's saying uh, because of their rejection of the Messiah, we Gentiles have been blessed to be able to be grafted in to the olive tree. Okay? He goes on and he says, he says, and I will feed the flock, in verse 7, of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves, and one I called beauty, and the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. He's even speaking to the remnant. There was a remnant of Israel that were truly saved, that truly owned Jesus as their Messiah. Uh, in today, we know many people, Messianic Jews, the first Christians were all Jews. The early church was made up of all Jews. It wasn't until about uh, really the turn of that century that the emphasis, uh, actually a little before that, that the, that the emphasis was on Gentiles. When the word started going forth to the Gentile world and the center of activity went from Jerusalem to Antioch that we read about in the book of Acts, and there, were, there started to be more Gentiles than Jews in the body of Christ, well, that, you know, the, the emphasis was changed. But there was always a remnant of Jewish believers. And there is today. 
he says, I've, I, 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 and I took unto me in verse 7 two staves, the one I called beauty and the other I called bands. Now, they say that the shepherd of that day would have two, uh, two staffs. One had a hook on it where he would be able to yank sheep back, and the other one was something he would use to defend against, um, like a staff to defend against, you know, creatures coming to uh, steal the sheep. One he called beauty or graciousness. You know, God was gracious to his people. He was uh, kind and loving to his people, the nation of Israel. Uh, the other one was called bands. And, and again, the word in Hebrew means union. God was unified with his people Israel. He was together with them. He was gracious to them. They were his people, and he was their God. And it says in verse 8, Three shepherds also I cut off in one month. Now, when you, when you talk to people about, or you read commentaries about this, everybody has an opinion on who the three shepherds were. But some believe, and I believe, that he's really talking about, like the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those who were in leadership at the time of Christ, the ones who rejected him, that's my opinion, you might have another one. But it says, the three shepherds also I cut off in one month, because those were the shepherds, they were supposed to be the shepherds of the people. They should have been the ones that should have pointed to Christ when they, when they realized his, what he was teaching and what he was claiming for himself. They should have realized, they should have been the ones who said, hey, there he is, there's the Messiah. They should have accepted him, but instead they rejected him. And he said, I cut them off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their souls also uh, aboard. Uh, now, when you think about this, and again, I'm just applying this to the day, I wonder what God thinks about people that stand up that are clergy, that are clerical, that deny the truth of God's word. How many shepherds, how many pastors of churches lead, are leading their people astray? And I'm not talking about pastors that fall into sin, that's one thing, but how many pastors are standing up and teaching falsehood? to their people. How many churches are there where, where pastors, and, I'm, and you know, we talk about like Roman Catholicism, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's easy enough, but I'm talking about in Pentecostal and fundamental and Baptist churches where they're starting to deny the very, the very foundations of the Christian faith. Instead of leading people to a, knowledge, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they lead people to become church members. And nothing wrong with joining a church, you know, but, but that doesn't save us. Yet, there are those, much of what, what goes on in churches today of all kinds, and not just one particular kind of church, but across the board. Much of what goes on are programs to increase membership and not sharing the gospel, not spreading the gospel. He says in verse 9, he says, Then said I, I will not feed you, uh, that that dies, let it die. And... Uh, that, that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one of the flesh of another. He's saying, I'm taking my hand off you. I'm not going to provide for you. I'm not going to, this is to the nation of Israel that rejected their Messiah. Zechariah seeing this prophetically 500 years before it happened. He said, I'm, I'm taking my hand off you. I'm not going to protect you. I'm not going to defend you. You're still my people. I'm going to keep my promises to you. There's going to come a time when I will restore you, but there's going to be a time when you are not, you're not going to be seen as my people, where I'm not going to be there for you. you know, people wonder, how could the Holocaust happen? If the Jews were God's people, how could God allow that horrible Holocaust to happen? But see, he took his hand off them because they called a curse upon themselves. They said, the leaders of the nation said, your blood be upon us. And again, that's what happened. He said, I will not feed you. Uh, if the ones are going to die, let them die. If you're going to be cut off, be cut off. The rest eat every one of the flesh of the other. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it in sunder. I took my graciousness that I have for my people, and I broke the staff. I would not be gracious to my people again until the time of the end, until the time when I would restore them that we read about in chapter 10. There was a time... God didn't tell them how long it was going to be. But there was a time when God's graciousness was removed from the nation of Israel. He says, I took my staff beauty and I cut it asunder that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day. 
And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Even the remnant, see again, there was, he keeps talking about the poor of the flock. And he's recognizing that there has always been people in Israel that were his people, that were saved by faith. He says, I said unto them in verse 12, if you think good, now, now, now listen to this prophecy of, you know, 500 years before it happened. He says, and I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price, what, 30 pieces of silver. Does that sound familiar? Of course, we know that when Judas betrayed Christ, what was the price they paid him? This was a picture that Zachariah was giving, a prophecy Zachariah was foretelling the thing that would happen when the good shepherd would be rejected by his people, when uh, they, would, they would call a curse upon themselves so that God would break the, the staff of beauty. He's saying, my price is 30 pieces of silver. That was the price, uh, if you go back to Exodus, and we're not, we're not going to turn there, but in Exodus, that was the price of an injured slave. If back in the, the, time of, uh, the time of Exodus, if I had a servant that was working for me and he happened to go past your, your property and you had a, a bull that came out and gored him, uh, you would have to pay him 30 pieces of silver. It was the price of a wounded servant. This is what Jesus was. He was a wounded servant. He said that was his price, the price of an injured slave. And he says... In verse 13, And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at them. He's, it's a facetious comment, 30 pieces of silver wasn't much. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Now, again, this is familiar. Turn with me, if you will, over to Matthew's Gospel. See, there, and, and the reason why it's so important to read this stuff, because some people will read this and say, well, what, you know, what is this about? We've got to know that God's word is true. You know, that these prophecies would, would come true just as they were given. If you look at Matthew chapter 27, and we'll just read a little bit. It's a story that we know. It says, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. Now somebody say, hey, Judas, Judas repented. Does that mean Judas got saved? Well, no. See, there's, you can feel sorry about doing for something and not be saved. Salvation isn't just feeling sorry for your sin. Salvation is a change of heart and a change of mind. But I believe that Judas here, he, was, he felt sorry for what he had done. But I don't believe he ever changed his mind. I don't, personally, I don't think Judas was ever truly saved. I don't, you know, he saw Jesus as being the, the one who would be king. And when he realized that Jesus wasn't going to allow them to make him king, I believe that's when he turned, that when inside, he turned on, on, on Christ. Because if you look back to uh, John chapter 6, and you read that chapter, that's where Jesus fed the 5,000, remember? And after they fed the 5,000, they wanted to make him the Messiah. They wanted to make him king. And Jesus said, no, he refused. He, he left them. And when they came back and said, Jesus, what's the deal? And he said, uh, he said, you just want to make me king because I fed your bellies, you know. And he said, what you really need to do is eat my flesh and drink my blood. And that's that in John chapter 6. And it says that at the end there, uh, when he got done saying that, many of his disciples left him. Many of them said, well, we, you know, we don't, we're not looking for that. And it's, that's the first time, I believe, where he mentioned that there was a devil in the camp, and that was Judas. And I believe that when Judas realized that Jesus wasn't going to be the, the king sitting on the throne of David at that time, he turned on him. Well, it says here that when Judas <laughs> realized that uh, he uh, betrayed an innocent man, he said uh, he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, tried to give the money back. And he said, I've sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said to him, what is that to us? See thou to that yourself. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went, and he hanged himself. See, I really believe, and, and this is, 
you know, just my opinion, you can need to take a look. If, if, if Judas would have asked Jesus to forgive him, I believe Jesus would have forgiven him. Because what he did wasn't that, that much worse than what Peter did. You know, Peter denied he knew him. I mean, he didn't betray him, but when the time came to stand up, Peter never stood up. He, he left. I really believe that Judas would have been forgiven had he asked for it, but he never did. He killed himself. And it says in verse 6, he threw the pieces of silver down in the temple, and the chief priest took the silver and said, it's not lawful to put this money into the treasury. Wow, they're getting all like, they're getting all righteous now, you know. After like murdering or, you know, sending their Messiah t to be murdered. They're saying, well, man, we can't, we can't put this money in. It's blood money. He says, we can't put this. He says, we can't put this in the treasury. It's the price of blood. And they took counsel and they bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Do you think they, they dug up Zechariah and said, Oh, okay, well, we'll do this because this is what Zachariah prophesied. They probably had no clue is what they were doing. They just, they didn't realize they were fulfilling prophecy. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. I heard somebody speak about this, and they said, you know, if you, if you remember, uh, Jeremiah talked about the potter's house, and he talked about uh, how a potter would make a pot, and if there's something wrong with it, he would take it and start all over again. And they said, like, if a guy was a potter back there, you know, uh, the, the, the front part of his place, you could go in there and, and see all his work and everything. And in the back would be a field with all the busted pots that didn't turn out too good, where he would throw them out. It was the garbage dump. Well, this is, the, well, this is what they bought. They bought a place called the Potter's Field, and it was really a place to bury uh, poor people. Uh, and it says that this was fulfilled, which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. Now, now this is one of those places where somebody would say, hey, wait a minute. Well, he's reading Zechariah, and he said Jeremiah. Well, this is one of those places they call a Bible difficulty. Now, I would like to pass over this a, a, a passage like this, but I'm not going to, because you need to understand what this is about. First of all, Jeremiah talked about the potter's field, didn't he? He talked about the potter's field. And it's believed that Matthew uh, kind of combined Jeremiah's prophecy and, and uh, Zechariah's prophecy together. And it's also said... And I've read about this because, you know, when I get a Bible difficulty, I don't want to ignore it. I want to try to deal with it. Uh, that in the Hebrew Bible, the, the prophets, the, the section called the prophets, begins with the book of Jeremiah. So some believe that they would call, you know, the, the book of the prophets, which would contain all the prophets, uh, the book of Jeremiah. So that's a little piece of information. If you find somebody astute enough to throw that one at you, okay, <laughs> it's not a contradiction and it's not a mistake, I believe. Because Jeremiah talked about the potter's field. He talked about the potter's house. He says, this was fulfilled that was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and he quotes from Zechariah, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. So we see that the, the prophecy in Zechariah deals specifically with Jesus Christ, deals specifically with the rejection of the Messiah of Israel. Okay, going back to Zechariah and just read a little bit more in that chapter. And it says, chapter 11, let me find it. I know it's here, I just had it. Okay. It says in verse 14, Then I cut mine other staff, even bands, the, the staff that was called Union, he said, not only did I take my graciousness from them, but I broke the staff of my unity with them. They are no longer my people. I, I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So we see this picture that Zechariah gives us prophetically of Messiah coming to his people, his people rejecting them, calling upon themselves uh, a curse, a curse, he said, his blood be upon us. And we see this, uh, the offering, his price, 30 pieces of silver. We see all this fulfilled in the person of Christ. And we see that when they rejected Christ from the time of the cross until the time of really the restoration of Israel, and, and really until, actually until the time of the return of Christ, we see God removing his hand from the nation of Israel. No longer would he be gracious to them. No longer would he be union, uh, unified with them because of the curse they called upon themselves. And we see all the things that Israel has suffered, the people of Israel have suffered in these last uh, 1,800, 1,900 years. 
Now, these next few verses deal with the replacement of the, of the Messiah. And, of course, we believe that there's a time coming when Israel will have a false Messiah, who we call the Antichrist, or who we call the, the man of sin, the son of perdition. There's a lot in the uh, New Testament about him, but read with me. It says, And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that stands still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Now we know from reading again in Daniel chapter 9 and uh, toward the end of that chapter, that when the Antichrist arises, this will be after the rapture of the church, after the, the calling in of the saints, when the Antichrist arises, he will, he will pose as a friend to Israel. As a matter of fact, they will see him as their Messiah. It says in Daniel, he'll make a, a, a pact with them. He'll make a, a league with them for seven years. Halfway through that seven years, he'll break that pact. And it says in uh, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, he'll set himself up in the temple to be worshipped as God. He'll set himself up as God. It's the foolish shepherd. He doesn't have the welfare of Israel. You know, these people nowadays that say they want peace in the Middle East, they don't want peace in the Middle East. They want to see Israel just gone. They're not, they, might, they might pose themselves as friends of Israel. They might shake their hand at the peace treaty, but they don't care about Israel existing. Most of, most of the world wants to see Israel disappear. We're going to read later on in Zechariah where Jerusalem is called a cup of trembling. To all nations. All, this, all the trouble that's going on in the world today is going over there. But this false shepherd that God will raise up, this antichrist, he'll, be, he'll, he'll look like a friend to Israel, but his, his intentions are much different. And he says this, Woe to the idle shepherd, that's I-D-O-L, the shepherd who will demand worship, that, leads, that leaves the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly dark. And this Antichrist, he'll, he'll look good, but he'll suffer the wrath of God. This is when God will once again establish his relationship with Israel that we're, we're going to read about in the next couple of chapters. I want, you, I want you to turn with me just a few more places. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, in, uh, it, it's a passage that we've read again. Whenever you talk about the Antichrist, it's a good one to read. Revelation chapter 13. And, uh, I'm not turning pages good tonight. And we'll start with verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up. This is the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. Rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon the horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power in his seat and great authority. I believe this beast represents the world system, the world uh, political system. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power. They'll worship the world. The whole world will worship this idol shepherd. He will be an idol to the entire world. And Israel at that time will be no different the nation of Israel. They'll worship him. They'll see him as the Messiah. They'll see him as the Savior of the world. He'll come speaking great words. It says that he'll do great works and calling down fire from heaven and so forth. And they'll see all this and they'll believe that this is indeed a, a, a deified person, a, a, a holy person. He says, they worship the dragon which gave power to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given un unto him to continue forty and two months. That's three and a half years, half of a seven-year period. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. 
And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the, in the Lamb's book of life. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Look at, look at verse 11. Just drop down quickly. Just read. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast. This is the Antichrist. The one, Satan's anointed. Satan's anointed. He says, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven and on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast and had the wound, uh, which had the wound by the sword and to live. The idol. There's going to there's gonna be an idol. They're going to set up an idol in the temple that all the world is going to worship. And eventually, this, this man, who's going to claim to be the Messiah of Israel, he's going to put himself in there to, to, to get the worship of the world. This is all coming to pass. This is going to happen. I thank God I'm not going to be here. I don't want to be here to see it happen. Some folks have made some movies about it. You got, I'll watch a movie about it, but I don't want to see it happen real. Okay, you know, we, we can use our imaginations how things are going to be. That's all right. But it's going to happen. This is what Zechariah saw. And as we read the, 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 the further chapters of Zechariah, we're going to see how this is going to come about. One more. And there's more there, but just, just, just one more place, and uh, we're going to close. Turn to Romans chapter 11, uh, just, just to see. Uh, and again, I encourage you to read Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 when it comes to Israel. <clears throat> I want you to see what Paul had to say. He began in chapter 9 saying, saying this. He said, I wish... Wait a minute, let me get it. All right. He says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not my conscience, also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul had a broken heart for his, his country people. Now some people will read this and say, well, he's really talking about the church. No, he's not. He's talking about his national brethren, his, his, his kinfolk, according to the flesh, the nation of Israel. And all through chapter 9 and 10 and 11, he talks about the nation of Israel. And look at chapter 11 and verse 1. And we're just going to read this. Because there's some folks who say, again, as I said before, there's some folks who say Israel is off the, off the chart and uh, the church is Israel. We're replacement. They call it replacement theology. That the, ch the, the church took the place of Israel and so forth. Listen to what Paul says. I say then, has God cast away his people? Well, he took his hand off of them. He broke the staff of beauty and he broke the staff of bands. He broke the graciousness and the union. But he says, has God cast away his people? Paul says, God forbid. For I also am a, an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. Why ye not what the scripture says of Elijah, how he makes intercession to God uh, against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets. Remember, Elijah said, I'm the only one left that worships you. But what does God say in verse 4? He says, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image bow. They're, they're saved people in Israel. Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Verse 7, what then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeks for, but the election has obtained it, and the rest uh, were blinded. In other words, those that have put their faith in Christ... They've received the promises. Uh, he says elsewhere that, you know, spiritual Israel is different than the national Israel, okay? We've been grafted into spiritual Israel. Listen to what he says. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. For to provoke them to jealousy, thank the Lord. 
Thank the Lord that the gospel came to the Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew. I don't have any Jewish blood in me. I don't have any claim to the promises that God made to the nation of Israel. You know, I'm Italian, German, uh, British, I don't know one, <laughs> but I, I, I'm not trained Jewish. Okay? Thank God that he had mercy. The Messiah was the glory of his people Israel and a light to the Gentiles. He goes on and he says this. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? If through their fall we receive salvation, how much more glorious will it be when God restores his relationship to the nation of Israel by faith? How much more glorious will it be? See, this is why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This is why it says uh, about Abraham, those who bless him will be blessed and those who curse him will be cursed. We need to pray and love the nation of Israel and pray for the salvation of Jews. If you have Jewish friends, pray for their salvation. There's a guy down the Y. That, uh, he, he comes down there every morning in, uh, when I'm down there. I said, Lord, give me a chance. So he hadn't been there last week. I, I was asking somebody. I didn't even know he was Jewish. Was, I was asking somebody, where's, his name's Dick. I said, where's Dick? They said, well, man, he, said something, he had something about his religion. It was the days of all, you know, it was the Feast of Trumpets and the days of all, and then the, the day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So he's, you know, he's celebrating his religious holidays. I'm saying, Lord, give me a chance to talk about them to him. I said, when I see him next week, I'm going to say, hey, Dick, where you been? And he'll say, well, it's religion. I said, oh, you man, you celebrating Yom Kippur? <laughs> you know, and, and uh, man, it's going to give me a chance to talk about who the real, who the real atonement is. I'm, uh, pray for me. I'll say the right things to him anyway. Uh, I want to see him saved. He's one of God's chosen people. He might not know it. I want to see him say, we need to pray for Israel. He says in verse, where was I? I, I left it off. Uh, well, let, let, let's just drop down for time's sake so we don't. Uh, read, read this. Read verse 13. He talks about being grafted in. We were the wild olive tree and we were grafted into the olive tree and so forth. But uh, look, at, look, at the, uh, uh, look at verse uh, uh, Look at verse 22. <laughs> Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God, of them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. Okay, now, folks that are once saved always, they need to point them there, okay? But anyway, on the list of verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again, meaning the, the Jews. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to the nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall those which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness is part, in part, is happened to Israel. This is what Zechariah is talking about. This is what we've been talking about since the crucifixion until now. Blindness, in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. There's going to come a time, and God's going to once again restore. And so all Israel shall be what? Saved. God's going to save his nation Israel. When we get back to Zechariah in the later chapters, we're going to find out that when Christ returns, they're going to look at him and they're going to say, where'd you get them holes in your hand? And they're going to find out that they crucified their Messiah. And they're going to weep and mourn bitterly, it says, when they realize what they had done. They cost themselves 2,000 years of being, being released, of, of being, the graciousness being broken and the, and the union being broken because of their rejection of their Messiah the first time. But when he comes back, the nation of Israel will be saved. They'll be no longer not my people, but they'll be his people and he'll be their God. It's not happened yet. It's getting there. It's moving in that direction. But believe me, there's coming a time when Jesus is going to return. And when he does, when he comes back, we're going to be coming back with him. Praise the Lord. When he comes back and sets his foot on the Mount of Olives, we're coming back with him. And when he does, man, we're going to see, we're going to see the nation of Israel restored to the God that called them out of Egypt. You know, that nation, they became a nation <clears throat> on their way from Egypt to uh, the Promised Land, to Canaan Land. When God made a covenant with them, he said, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. And I said... We'll do it. They put their hand up. Forty days later, they were worshiping the golden calf. But God never completely took his hand off of them. And even though for the last few thousand years, they've suffered all these things, and God has 
He has removed his protection and he's removed his union. There's coming a time he's going to restore it all. Count on it because that's what God, God's word says. And we're going to see it happen. Amen?